Hey everyone, before the video begins, a big shout out to the channel Animated Horror Stories. He has some really great content, so be sure to check out his channel in the link below. Phoebe Ann Mosey, known famously as Annie Oakley, was born on the 13th of August 1860 in a very rural part of Ohio. Her parents, Susan and Jacob Mosey, were Quakers of English descent. As a young girl, Annie lived on a farm with her parents and her numerous brothers and sisters in Dark County, Ohio. When Annie was just five years old, she began trapping birds and other small animals, which provided extra food for her family. Despite coming from an impoverished household, some of the happiest times of her life included trapping and hunting in the nearby fields and woods. During the winter of 1865, Annie's father headed into town to buy certain supplies he needed for the farm. However, during the journey a strong blizzard kicked up, leading to him getting hypothermia. In the following months, Jacob became very sick and was unable to care for himself. He eventually died as a result of his illnesses in March 1866, aged 67. Annie's mother Susan was now a widow and had to look after seven children without having the means to do so. Due to this, the family moved to a smaller home and most of the children couldn't attend school regularly. Instead, they all worked hard to provide for each other. In the evenings, Annie's mother Susan would gather the children to sing hymns and pray. For her, it was important to instill Quaker values into her kids. Despite young Annie being good at trapping, one day she decided to use her father's old muzzle-loading gun in hopes of providing even more food for her family. She was just seven years old at the time. It soon became apparent that she was a natural-born sharpshooter. Despite Annie's success, the family was soon again plunged deep into poverty after the death of her eldest sister. The medical and funeral expenses meant food was scarce and money was short. As a result, some of Susan's children were temporarily taken care of by other families. On the 15th of March 1870, Annie, along with her sister Ellen, moved to the Dark County Infirmary where they were taught to sew, decorate, and helped to look after the younger children. Annie was just nine at the time. Around three weeks later, a man came to the infirmary asking for a young girl to keep his wife company and help look after their infant son. According to the man, nothing else was required of whoever accepted. As well as this, they would receive an education and 50 cents per week, about $10 today. With her mother's permission, Annie went to work for the family. According to her, the first month was fine, but after that, she was heavily exploited. In her autobiography, Annie stated that, I got up at four o'clock in the morning, got breakfast, milked the cows, fed the calves, the pigs, pumped water for the cattle, fed the chickens, rocked the baby to sleep, weeded the garden, picked wild blackberries, got dinner after digging the potatoes for dinner and picking the vegetables, and then could go hunting and trapping. Of course, by now Annie wanted to go home, but she couldn't. The two adults whom she referred to as the wolves forced her to stay, essentially enslaving her. They even wrote letters to her mother, stating that she was happy and attending school. The constant abuse endured by Annie reached new heights when on one occasion she fell asleep over a big basket of stockings. Upon seeing Annie asleep, Mrs. Wolf struck her on the ear, pinched her arm and as punishment, locked her outside in the freezing snow. Within minutes, Annie, who had no shoes on, felt her feet go numb. She later described how she got on her knees, looked up at the sky and prayed to God. But as her lips were frozen shut, there was no sound. Annie was just 10 years old at the time. In the spring of 1872, after almost two years with the wolves, Annie finally ran away. She made her way to a train depot but as she had no money, she couldn't make her way home. Luckily, a kind man was willing to hear Annie's story, later buying her food and a ticket home. Worryingly, the wolves tracked Annie, and one day, the he-wolf, as Annie called him, 
turned up at her school. Fortunately, he was turned away by a large man that Annie knew, and he never returned. This experience as a child led Annie to be selfless later in life. Regarding this, she stated, If I spend one dollar foolishly, I see tear-stained faces for little children beaten, as I was. Back home, Annie continued hunting with a rifle and was soon supporting her whole family. She became an exceptional markswoman and the excess game she killed was sold to a merchant called Charles Kanzenberger, who distributed it to restaurants and hotels all over Ohio. By the time she was 15, she had saved enough money to pay off the mortgage on their family home. As time passed, her shooting prowess made her known throughout the state. In the spring of 1881, the Boffman and Butler Shooting Act was being performed in Cincinnati. The show's main star was the Irish-American marksman Frank E. Butler. While in the city, Frank made a bet with a hotel owner, Jack Frost, that he could beat any local shooter. Jack Frost received information that an outstanding unknown marksman would challenge Frank, and so he accepted the bet. The match was promptly arranged, and Frank Butler would meet his contestant just 10 days later with a bet of $100 per side. It was in a little town near Greenville that Frank met young Annie. Of course, Frank was surprised and even laughed when he saw that his contestant was a young girl who was just five feet tall. Throughout the match, the two were tied, hitting every single bird. However, Frank missed his 25th shot, giving Annie the victory. Not long after, the two became close and married just a year after. It should be stated that there's lots of debate about the year of the match, as well as the marriage. Many sources claim that the match took place in 1875, when Annie was just 15, and that the couple married in August 1876. However, a marriage certificate states that they were wed on the 20th of June 1882 in Windsor, Ontario. In any case, the couple first performed together in a show on the 1st of May 1882. Initially, Frank was the star always showcasing his talents. Meanwhile, Annie was in the background. Annie's first big break came when she replaced her husband's usual partner who was ill. It was during this time that she adopted the stage name Oakley, which the world would later know her by. Yet in private, she was Mrs. Frank Butler. Over the next few years, the pair traveled around the US with crowds coming from all over to watch their shooting exhibitions. The couple also had a dog named George, who was essential to the act. In March 1884, Sitting Bull, a Native American leader, saw Annie Oakley perform in St. Paul, Minnesota. Impressed by her skills, the leader met her after the show. In time, the two became friends and had great respect for each other, with Sitting Bull later symbolically adopting her as he had lost a daughter at the Battle of Little Bighorn. He also gave her the nickname Little Sure Shot, which would be used in public advertisements for years to come. In 1885, Frank Butler and Annie Oakley joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Up until now, Butler was the main performer, earning more than Oakley. However, this changed once they joined the Wild West. Oakley was on all the posters, being labelled as the champion markswoman. Once it was clear that Oakley was to be the show's star, Butler primarily worked as her manager and assistant. Yet, in 1886, an even younger female sharpshooter joined the show, becoming Oakley's direct rival. Lillian Smith was just 15 at the time, almost as good as Oakley, and began to receive favourable press coverage. It was likely due to this that Oakley made people believe that she was 20 years old at the time, when in reality, she was 26. In 1887, Queen Victoria celebrated her Golden Jubilee, Entertainment was needed for this grand event, and the Wild West show was invited to perform. The production arrived in England and began performing in May 1887. Oakley's skills were on the top of her game, and as a result, she received favourable press. 
The English papers were quick to highlight her incredible talents as well as her intriguing Western background. While in England, she became somewhat of a celebrity, especially in shooting circles. Oakley received numerous gifts and was invited to many social events. Once the Wild West show left England, the production toured Europe, performing in France, Italy and Spain. During this time, Oakley exhibited her skills in front of European royalty and heads of state. One legend surrounding Oakley's life is that while in Europe, she shot the ashes of the German Kaiser Wilhelm II's cigarette while it was in his mouth. In truth, the cigarette was in the Kaiser's hand. The European tour cemented Oakley as America's first female star. She was the face of the Wild West show and earned more than any other performer. For many years, Oakley continued to perform as a sharpshooter for the Wild West show, fascinating audiences with her stunts. Some of her best tricks included shooting cigarettes from her husband's lips and dimes from his hand. She was also able to shoot while standing on a galloping horse and make holes through cards before they landed on the ground. Oakley also knew how to shoot small targets from long distances while using a mirror. In November 1894, Oakley and Butler performed in one of the world's first ever films. It was called The Little Sure Shot of the Wild West and it was created with Edison's kinetoscope in his studio, the Black Maria. In 1898, Oakley wrote a letter to President William McKinley offering the government the services of a company of 50 lady sharpshooters who would provide their own arms and ammunition should the US go to war with Spain. Oakley was a strong advocate of women's rights and promoted the service of women in the armed forces. Although the war broke out, her offer was rejected. In 1901, Oakley was in a train accident that left her extremely injured. As a result, she had to undergo five spinal operations. Fortunately, she recovered. The following year, she left the Buffalo Bill show and started acting in the stage play, The Western Girl. After years of performing as a sharpshooter, she finally decided to retire in 1913. She settled down with her husband in Cambridge, Maryland. During their retirement, the butlers passed time by hunting and fishing. They were also active members in the local community and were liked by all, especially when they performed to raise money for the county fair. While in retirement, the butlers did a lot of traveling, especially to the south of the US. Although they liked Cambridge, in 1917, they sold their home and moved to Pinehurst, North Carolina. When the First World War broke out, Oakley wrote to Henry L. Stimson, the Secretary of War, offering to teach soldiers how to shoot accurately, as well as to fund and raise a regiment of women volunteers to fight. Nevertheless, both her offers were rejected. In 1922, despite being over 60 years old, Annie continued to set records and even performed to huge crowds in many major cities. She was eager to star in a new film and had various projects planned out. However, in November of the same year, a nasty car crash led to her being in critical condition. As a result, she had to wear a steel brace on her right leg and it took her almost a year to fully recover. However, recover she did and by the end of 1923, she was shocking crowds with her incredible precision as she had done her whole life. Despite being 63 years of age, some considered Annie Oakley to still be the greatest marksman in the world. Sadly, by 1925, Annie Oakley's health started to go downhill. In order to be closer to her family, she and her husband moved back to Annie's hometown of Greenville. Annie Oakley died on the 3rd of November, 1926, aged 66, due to a pernicious anemia. She was later cremated and her ashes were buried at Brock Cemetery near Greenville. Butler died just three weeks later. Apparently, following his wife's death, he grieved so much that he stopped eating. He was buried next to her ashes. Annie Oakley is believed to have taught more than 15,000 women how to use a gun over her life. 
She said, I would like to see every woman know how to handle guns as naturally as they know how to handle babies. After her death, it was noted just how generous Oakley was with her money. Large parts of her wealth were sent to her relatives in Ohio, especially her numerous nieces and nephews. She also donated money to many orphans and charities. Annie Oakley's life has inspired many books, TV shows, films and plays. She is widely remembered as a Western folk hero and American legend. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Annie Oakley. As mentioned before, be sure to check out the channel Animated Horror Stories. If you enjoyed this video, please leave me a thumbs up and if you're new, why not subscribe? If you have any suggestions, please send me an email which is in the description or leave me a comment down below. Anyway, I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks!